Yeah, hi, hi Alex, and uh, thanks for uh, renominating and uh, putting up with me for another 12 months. Um, something that uh, I'm very proud of is what Alex has done. Uh, he's, he's finished the training syllabus, uh, and I'm hoping he's going to announce that he's basically got the training manual ticked over today. Um, but it's something that the association has been talking about for years and years and years, is putting something together that we can say, this is what our recommended training syllabus and manual is, and we can give it to all our members free of charge, and we can supply it to any training facility free of charge. Not that we're saying that they have to use it, but they can look at it, they can, they can use parts out of it, they can use it in whole, however they want to use it. But we. We suffered um, some incidents some time ago and it may have been put down to poor training. So what we wanted to do, and RAOs also asked us if we could uh, develop a training manual that they could use. And uh, this is the benefit, what we're getting out of it. And we've finally got Alex who's put the time into doing this. And uh, I'm from what I've seen of it, it's going to be a fantastic document and it will be something that we'll all be able to use. So without any further ado, I'll hand it over to Alex. Thank you. Thank you. All righty, well, um, I'll uh, just dive uh, straight into it. I'll just uh, quickly share my screen and pull up the PowerPoint. Oh, you've apparently you've disabled screen sharing, David. Uh, well, anyway, um, in the meantime, just while that's coming up, I um, thought I'd uh, give a shout out to some of the people that have been uh, helping me along the way. Uh, in particular, uh, Chad, uh, we've had a few phone conversations in particular with dealing with CASA. Um, as I'll explain, we are talking to them as well about amending the manual of standards for both floating hull and float plane. Um, as I'll describe later, uh, there's a lot of uh, wording issues, I guess is the best way of describing it, that um, yeah, they're not quite um, on par with what uh, should be uh, in the manual of standards. Um, but uh, yeah, I will be diving into both the training syllabuses that uh, we've developed as a team uh, for both floating hull and float plane um, and also uh, the training manual which unfortunately David is not 100% uh, completed but uh, it's uh, definitely uh, very very close to being uh, fully um, completed. Um, is it working now? Oh there we go we're on. righty. So um, just wanted to quickly go through, I pretty much just went through that, but uh, the uh, sparse training team's aims and objectives. Uh, we'll talk about the Waterborne Training Manual, which is both the syllabus and the training manual uh, in, in one document, and also the CASA Part 61 Manual of Standards Amendments uh, that we're currently uh, talking to CASA with, and uh, any questions uh, that you guys have at the end of the presentation. Okay, so the SPA training team. So our aim was to, to develop a national standardized training program uh, for seaplanes that ensure safe and correct training is provided to students. So just to give you the backstory in particular about myself, I'm extremely passionate about check and training within um, uh, the float plane industry in particular. I haven't got my hands on floating hulls yet, but in a broad spectrum, definitely uh, very passionate about seaplanes. As I'm sure you can all understand, um, any ramifications that happen with a seaplane accident worldwide, whether it be in the Maldives, Canada, America, or Australia, has impacts on the whole industry. In particular, when it comes to that naughty word called insurance. So, um, you know, at least a, within Australia, we can do our part to ensure that the um, industry remains incredibly safe. Um, objectives um, to achieve our aim was to develop the SPAA Waterborne Training Manual that is compliant with the part 61 MOS for the grant of a float plane or floating hull design feature endorsement and in cooperation with CASA amend the outdated and incorrect part 61 manual of standards. Alrighty, so let's uh, dive into it. So the waterborne training manual, what is it? I wanted to break it down for people that might not be as uh, entwined with how CASA regulations and training 
uh, are about as to how we went about building this waterborne training manual. So now the uh, way that we essentially went about building it was uh, you go to the part 61 MOS, from the part 61 MOS, that essentially describes what you need to tick off, what training needs to be provided to a student, whether it's for an endorsement, for a rating, um, whatever it might be. It outlines everything, both theoretical knowledge, underpinning knowledge, practical training uh, as such. Um, from there, we then developed the training syllabuses, which I've got some screen captures for you to essentially show you what the training syllabus uh, looks like. And that's essentially of what do we need to tick off uh, for someone to be given a floating hull or a float plane endorsement. From that, once we had the training syllabuses, we then went into building the training manual. Now, the best way to describe the training manual is not giving the instructors or students or anyone that wishes to read um, the training manual uh, every single piece of um, uh, material to do uh, such training. It is more a how to do it. So for example, if we were coming to the lesson of teaching someone how to uh, step taxi, um, we give ideas of what tasks you should be doing. So for example, doing a figure eight task. So that's what the training manual is. It's, it's more of a, these are the steps or the processes that we would recommend that you do um, during the course of training. Now, all of this put together, so the training manual, the training syllabus and the part 61 MOS then forms our waterborne training manual, uh, which is very on near completion. So um, we'll dive into uh, the waterborne training manual. I've got the float plane training syllabus as an example, and I'm just gonna walk through how we actually develop the syllabus so you can get an idea of what is in the syllabus and how it was built itself. So um, once we've captured what part 61 MOS, uh, in particular DFE 8, uh, which stands for Design Feature Endorsement 8, which is float plane, we can then build a training or a planning matrix, which breaks down what's in the manual of standards, what we need to do, and how we can go about then doing it. So you can see from the uh, extract on the left-hand side, DFE, we'll go to DFE 2, which is the second one down, conducting pre-flight inspection of an amphibious aircraft. So you can then see that that is then broken down into the lessons, and we'll talk about it in a moment, but also the uh, competency standards uh, as we go across in the uh, uh, number of lessons or lectures um, that we do throughout the course of training. So this is breaking down this planning matrix as to what needs to be done, how many lessons do we need it to be done in, or how many briefings need to be done, and then also developing our uh, competency standards as we go along uh, this training. So at the end product, we have a, um, uh, a student who is now a qualified uh, seaplane pilot um, that we're comfortable enough can go out and safely fly uh, that aircraft. From there, we um, then went actually and started building the lessons. Um, so in this particular case uh, for uh, both float plane and floating hull, there's um, uh, five lectures or briefings, uh, which can be broken down to be before a flight, after a flight, um, and uh, also uh, recommended ground hours for how long it would take to cover uh, such topics. And um, then it goes into the actual flight. So in this particular case, five flights. Um, if you have a reasonably competent student, um, should get uh, the job done. Um, breaks down, uh, once again, well, it doesn't really break down what is covered in the lessons as um, there's actually lesson plans built into this syllabus, um, which it covers it a little bit more detail. But this is essentially the overview of the entire endorsement or the entire course of training um, that will be completed. So from there, uh, as I just mentioned, we actually build, uh, built the lesson plans. Now, um, just while I've got it here, because you will notice up the top, there's a lot of filling out of... Um, information, the training syllabuses also double up as a, a record of training. So all instructors are required to keep a record of training of what actually has been done, what has covered, ticked off uh, as such. And uh, my mind's not on it at the moment, but I believe you have to keep it for seven years. Um, so this whole training syllabus 
completely doubles up um, as a record of training for instructors if they so wish to use it uh, as a record of training. But uh, this in particular goes more into it. So for example, this is flight two basic water work uh, going into um, you know, water circuits, um, you know, the, the real basic stuff and underpinning knowledge. Uh, so that's the lesson plan. It, it dives in a lot deeper, but if we put the, the whole training syllabus up, we'd be here for quite a while. But it's really just, yeah, breaking down the lesson into what will be covered um, or what has been covered um, in the lesson. Um, as part of the lesson plan, there is also the standards of competency. So in this particular, we're still on the basic water work. Uh, it can see we've still got, or we have now um, got all of the manual of standards uh, from the MOS laid out again. Um, so all the boxes that we need to tick in this particular lesson um, to consider it uh, achieved. Uh, and then also uh, the performance standards. So what are we aiming for the student to achieve? Um, and you can see them up in the, the performance standards up in the right corner. Um, and then at the end of the flight, the instructor would actually go and mark what the student has achieved um, in that particular case. And I haven't included it uh, in this particular presentation, but at the end of each lesson plan, there is actually a, a, like a conclusion section where the uh, instructor writes notes, signs off and recommends whether the student goes on. So it's a lot more formalized um, syllabus in training um, that is all completely compliant with CASA um, record keeping, but also uh, with the manual of standards. Um, so just to tie off the uh, training syllabus, uh, uh, both training syllabus combine to form, uh, all, well, all of it combines to form the training syllabus for the endorsement and each one's a 50 page document. So um, yeah, quite large documents, um, but it essentially required for training. Uh, and as I've mentioned a few times, it does double up as a record of training that instructors are required to keep. And uh, as David has already mentioned, uh, both floating hull and float plane training syllabuses are completely uh, or fully completed and have also been drafted by um, other people outside of the uh, committee and the training team. So really excited to um, have that training syllabus, or both of them completed. All righty, the training manual. So as I mentioned just before we got the uh, PowerPoint up, it's designed to assist instructors with developing their own course of training. So i.e. Um, we're not giving people PowerPoints, we're not giving them um, you know, full briefing notes as such. Um, the training manual is there to do, help steer them in the right direction as to what needs to be covered in a particular section of training for a very safe outcome that is ensured that we have ticked the right boxes and they have received the right amount of training um, uh, to be a safe seaplane pilot. And uh, yeah, so, but I'll, I'll dive into uh, essentially, for example, uh, of the training manual, we've got briefing one, which is rules and regulations. So it goes into an aim, the objectives, once again, trying to standardize what we're trying to achieve in each briefing or flight. Resources required to actually achieve um, uh, this particular briefing in this case, and then topics covered. Um, what I haven't included in here is also at the end of each section, we've got key points. So what are we trying to get the student to understand in that flight or that, that briefing, the very key points. Once again, to bring it all back that we're trying to standardize so that we know that pilots are coming out and they've got a safe understanding and safe um, way of going about flying seaplanes. Um, so uh, as I said, it's uh, still under construction and I am almost positive I can say that it uh, will 100% be completed by uh, June this year, just taking up a little bit more of my time than one would have thought. But um, uh, once both of these, um, the training manual and the training syllabuses are put together, the form of waterborne training manual, um, as David's already said, I think it'll be an exceptional uh, asset to the Seaplane Pilots Association. Um, and um, I truly do hope that people even if they use bits and bobs of it, um, 
we'll use it and, and we can really start a proper standardization of seaplane training uh, in Australia. Uh, all right, the uh, CASA Part 61 Manual of Standards um, update. So the aims of the training team and SPA were to identify errors in the Part 61 MOS and then to work with CASA uh, to correct such errors. Now, um, just to dive in, I'll, I'll put up an example here, which is one that has um, stirred the pot uh, in the last uh, 12 months is in particular the float plane um, uh, manual of standards. Uh, and you'll notice um, there's a lot of key wording around here about amphibious aircraft. So operate an amphibious aircraft, land an amphibious aircraft. Um, and the, the weird, the wording with this, and we've had it clarified, is that as you saw with the training syllabus, we extract the manual of standard. And that's what we have to tick off as instructors to then issue a endorsement or whatever it might be. So the question we asked to CASA was, if it says operate an amphibious aircraft during all phases of flight, can you get a float plane endorsement on a straight float aircraft? Before anyone gets a little bit too um, uh, out there, I believe you should be, okay? I believe that you should be able to get a float plane endorsement on a um, straight float aircraft. But that's not the problem here. The problem is that the legal wording says that you have to operate an amphibious aircraft to receive or to tick the boxes to receive a float plane endorsement, okay? So CASA didn't give us a very clear cut answer when it came to this particular case, but they did say that that is the wording. So we've gone about rewording or, or essentially building a draft new manual of standards for both floating hull, because there's a few little um, tweaks that we wanted to make in there just to expand it slightly. Uh, but in particular, get this um, amphibious aircraft wording out. Um, and uh, I'll just go to the next slide, which has got, oh, what's going on here? Here we go. Uh, so this is, for example, our draft of the new manual of standards, which is exactly the same as the one we were just discussing. So instead of just land the seaplane or the land the amphibious aircraft or take off the amphibious aircraft, it's a lot more expanded as into what are the boxes that we need to tip. So um, I'm not going to read through all of them, but um, you know, a lot more depth to the required training um, uh, required to tick off um, on the uh, on the manual of standards side of thing. So next to them, these are the exact same uh, uh, or segments essentially. Um, but expanded on quite significantly. So this is what we're trying to achieve uh, with CASA. And I do believe we are making uh, headway with them. And um, I'd like to think that hopefully by the end of the year before they go on Christmas break, um, we should be able to have this new manual of standards amended uh, once it's gone through um, countless uh, uh, period of um, people discussing it. But, uh, the other section that we, uh, sorry, I've already uh, talked about that, um, was CASA's understanding of amphibious aircraft endorsements, because this was where the, uh, a lot of people got a bit wound up when they found that we were talking with CASA about uh, updating the manual of standards. Now, CASA's understanding of uh, amphibious aircraft. So let me just get my words so we all, I know that we're on the same page. So when it comes to um, amphibious aircraft, CASA essentially believes that you can operate an amphibious aircraft if you've got a floating hull endorsement or a float plane endorsement, but have never touched an amphibious aircraft before, as long as you've done a retractable undercarriage endorsement. Okay. Now, uh, a lot of people share the same opinion with me in the fact that if you haven't received any form of training on um, 
the mentality of operating an amphibious aircraft, that could be a, a recipe for some uh, very bad accident to occur. As um, I'll discuss in a moment, I believe there's three types of pilots uh, in the world. Um, but essentially, Cass's understanding is, yeah, that if you've got a retractable undercarriage, um, you're good to go with amphibious aircraft. Uh, but there's no form of training in operating amphibious gear systems in a retractable undercarriage endorsement, nor is there any non-technical skills training required for a float plane or amphibious aircraft uh, in the retractable undercarriage endorsement. Um, and the retractable undercarriage endorsement can be given by someone that's never ever touched the water before. So what I'm leading to is that we want to also place in the manual of standards in both float plane and floating hull, a form of non-technical skills training when it comes to the operation of amphibious aircraft. But um, as I'm sure you're all aware, for example, in the floating hull world, um, it's you're pretty hard stretched to find a floating hull aircraft that isn't an amphibious aircraft. So that's already required in training, but on the float plane side of the world, um, at the moment, every single operator in Australia that can give out a float plane endorsement, oh, sorry, I lie, except um, Steve Krug in Sydney, uh, is straight float. So Melbourne seaplanes, um, uh, Maroya, West, uh, sorry, South Coast seaplanes, and also Port Macquarie, um, they're all straight float aircraft. So we really wanna also protect them because from a legal standpoint, I'd hope that it never got to that point, but yeah, the, the wording is, is incorrect at the moment in the manual standards. So we're trying to fix that up and clarify that. Um, so just what I was saying before about there's three types of pilots in the world. So this is where we're trying to build a non-technical skills training with float planes. So even if you are, oh, sorry, for amphibious aircraft. So even if you are flying a straight float seaplane in whatever capacity it might be, we want during the training of the endorsement for you to pretend that it is an amphibious aircraft. Because it's very important that we start switching the pilot to an amphibious style of pilot. And this is where it comes back to what I was saying about my three types of pilots in the world. So we have the fixed gear pilot that's never, that doesn't have a retractable undercarriage, has never flown a retractable undercarriage um, plane before, doesn't pay attention to what their gear's doing because there's no need for them to. Then you have the retractable undercarriage uh, uh, pilot who is green is good, red or orange is bad. That's as far as they go um, with regards to their perception of where their gear system is. Where an amphibious pilot that's got experience with the system, they are always double checking, where am I going? What surface is it? And where does my gear have to be? Because green doesn't always mean good and blue doesn't always mean good. We actually have to constantly think about where our gear is. And um, if any of you are lucky enough to uh, hear Dan Bolton's um, uh, podcast or even his presentation, I believe at the last seaplane conference, a substantial amount of this accidents that occur worldwide from seaplanes is gear, gear down water landings. And that comes from lack of training, checking, and having the mentality of being an amphibious gear pilot instead of the, the, the latter. So we really wanna bring that non-technical skills side of training into the manual of standards so that we can still ensure that we have safe pilots flying around Australia, but allow people that are operating straight float aircraft to conduct float plane endorsements or floating hull endorsements. So that's where the amending of the manual of standards is coming into it is trying to clear up all of this stuff. So just to round off, you do your floating hull or your float plane training where whatever plane it might be, as long as it's obviously legal and, and a, 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 you know, correct for that specific training. And then we have the amphibious gear mentality training or that non-technical skills comes together and the endorsement's granted once they reach the competency standards. Uh, so yeah, so we wanted to clear up the wording and include training on amphibious gear operations regardless of what aircraft uh, it's uh, capable of. So um, yeah, that was essentially it for me. I didn't want to keep you too long because I'm 
uh, sure you're all um, uh, ready for a coffee or a beer. I don't know which one uh, I prefer, but um, yeah, any questions I'm more than happy to answer. Thanks, Alex. Uh, that's an amazing amount of work and a great presentation. So thank you.